River Revival, Working Together to Save the Minnesota River, is brought to you by the Minnesota Agricultural Water Resources Coalition. Fifteen farm organizations working together to improve water quality in the Minnesota River and throughout the state. River Revival is a production of the Water Resources Center at Minnesota State University, Mankato. Additional funding provided by the Minnesota River Board, the Minnesota Valley National Wildlife Refuge and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the Agricultural Drainage Management Coalition, and the Minnesota Valley Trust. In the rapids, if you fall out, just stand up. Come on down to the river. These are all students from Montevideo High School. Come on down with me. We're going to go down the Lackapower River from Dawson to Lackapower County Park. Come on down to the river. It's great just to get out on the river. Running wild and being free. Look at the beauty we have here. Come on down to the river. If you haven't been there, then you can't appreciate it the way you can if you paddled it, if you've seen all the wildlife that live on the sides. Come on down to the river. Running wild and being free. Butch Halderman teaches high school biology in Montevideo. Every summer since the early 1990s, he has taken students canoeing and camping on the rivers in the Minnesota River Valley. What I wanted to do was inspire a new generation of young ecologists that understood the river and how important it is to us. About the same time, Butch also helped start an organization in Montevideo called CURE, Clean Up the River Environment. This is CURE's 19th annual banquet. Uh, I remember our very first meeting, it was Butch Halterman stood up and said, I have a band, we can play down by the river and we can raise money and, and, uh, you know, and so boom, that's what we did. So we had our first river revival. CURE is one of several citizen-led organizations working with farmers, government, and business enterprises to improve water quality in the Minnesota River. That's the holy grail. How do we grow food without making the water dirty? And farmers are the key people that are going to figure it out. They're the most resourceful, inventive people I know. As a fourth generation farmer, I'm making decisions based not only on what is good uh, financially or good business for today, I'm making decisions on what is good for future generations. I also think about would my predecessors here be proud or happy with the way that I'm doing things. In our travels up and down the Minnesota River Valley, we met hundreds of folks working together to save the Minnesota River from decades of abuse and neglect. It represents a cultural shift, a cultural shift in our historical attitude toward rivers. Rivers were treated like drainage ditches, garbage dumps, sewers. No, 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 this is a prime recreation area. This is where the remnant of the wild still lives. We have to celebrate and get to know these places. So that's the cultural shift that I've seen happen in 20 years. And this is really important because it's how we think about things and how we regard them that changes our attitudes and our behaviors. The place where we start is that clean water is just a fundamental value for all Minnesotans. The second thing that I think that everybody understands is that it's everyone's responsibility to get clean water. And in the case of the Minnesota River, you know, we've had a tremendous amount of people all working together doing something. Thanks for coming. I'm Meet Ron Boldwin and his daughter Lori. Very, very they call themselves well, River Rangers. It's a program to get young people and adults in the outdoors to see what the beauty we have around us, walk the woods, see what it's like. The ultimate goals is that you're going to grow up to be good environmental citizens, right? On a sunny October morning, they've come to see oh, an incredible double waterfall at Miniopa State Park. And even if you've seen it before, it still is one of the more impressive falls in the Minnesota River Valley. A long, long time ago, a virgin wind began to blow, which in time would melt the snow, giving birth to a mighty river's flow. Falls in the Minnesota River Valley that we're in were formed when the glaciers receded about 12,000 years ago. In truth, the river has an extensive geological history, 
And to understand that history is to understand the Minnesota River. Geologist Carrie Jennings. Place where the Jolly Green Giant campaign was designed and it is a giant valley and it's it's hard to appreciate if you've grown up here but valleys like this just don't occur everywhere. What we're seeing is really the result of a catastrophic discharge of water from a, a very large glacial lake, a lake that was bigger than all the Great Lakes put together, that drained very suddenly, burst a dam of some sort in, near the town of Big Stone. A wall of water was sent down through kind of the central lowland in Minnesota. So if you look across the other side, a little bit above St. Peter, where the campus is, um, that was the surface. So this is entirely new, this valley here between us and that town over there. It's over a mile wide at this point. You have now a valley in the landscape that's 150 feet plus below the surface where most of the streams are flowing. So as they come from that surface down into the valley, they have a lot of gravity actually speeding up the water. And we still have a lot of waterfalls along the edge of this valley where there's bedrock to kind of hold up that fall. But in other places where you just have a thick stack of glacial sediment, you get these very deep ravines. They deposit the sediment that they're moving into the valley here. And then eventually it gets deposited into Lake Pepin, which is kind of a local stopping point in Minnesota for all fine suspended sediment. You know, the silt and the clay that doesn't settle out of the water very easily. So it's natural for rivers to be cutting into this upper flat surface, depositing their sediment into the valley. What's not natural is the rate that that's happening now. No, the river is the indicator of what's happening on the land. Societies rise and fall based on how well we take care of our topsoil. We are in a process where we've lost half of the topsoil we started with, you know, in less than 125 years of cultivation. So we're on a, a path towards desertification. This is all the stuff that carries down. Charles Smith is a young-looking 70-year-old <laughs> who has lived just below Minimishinona Falls his entire life. Over the years, he has seen and photographed the changes to the falls and his farm. This was kind of the shallow end of the lake. There used to be about seven or eight feet of water in here. And then the edge of the lake was in, in here. It just all come down off the hillsides. But you're standing on eight, nine feet of fill. Hard to believe that. But this was lake shore when I was a kid. The state climatologist indicates that we're getting more convective storms of greater intensity rains, which means that the streams themselves have larger floods, have higher peak flows, um, and so they are more erosive. The main problem here is, is the speed it comes down. It seems to be the way we manage water that affects the river quality. It's not a surprise. The green solid lines are new, six inch. They're tiling every 50 feet. Charles says the change he's seen in the creek is evidence of land use changes upstream. All the drainage out of the drain ditches and everything, they keep widening, cleaning, and draining more and more all the time so it's faster. You give a river more water to work with, it becomes more erosive. So we're seeing more sediment coming from places where the river kind of impacts a bank or a bluff. Geologist Carrie Jenny. You just tend to be in a hurry to move water off the landscape. No matter what we do on the surface, whether it's, it's urbanizing an area or putting a roof on a, on a lot or draining agricultural fields, it's all has the same effect, which is to hurry water to the stream, to get it there as quickly as possible. Unfortunately, we're in the way of the city. All that drainage from the city is coming this way. Clearly, Charles and others along the river are worried about the future of our namesake river. When they get in and they let them develop like they're doing up on top here, they don't have any plans for that water, really. They'd really have to put in some really good control ponds to hold back some of that, and I doubt if they're going to do that because they don't want to go to the expense of doing that. They don't pay for the trouble it causes downstream.